What do you think Jesus meant when he said that it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God? I understand the typical interpretation, but in the non-dual, how would this work? Dessa, it's been such a long time since you asked that question, probably about five weeks, six weeks, and I said I would look at it, only getting back to it now. There's also another one from somebody that links, links to this that I found that I will also come back to. But I'm going to be really, oh, a lot of things to cover, and I hope I remember it all. In fact, I'm going to light a candle because I really want this to be, my head's all over the place. And we'll be talking about the difference between mind and spirit. So this is a candle to represent that I just want to be in touch with the light, with the spirit, in the way that I speak about this and the way I'm inspired. So I'm setting my intention for that now with this candle. And I'll put it there so I can keep looking at it. So we'll be thinking about the kingdom of God, what that means, thinking about causal realm, and that leads us into thinking about different kind of bodies, the uh, different, in the Hindu tradition they call them sheaths or uh, koshas, I think they're also called. Looking at the Beatitudes a little bit, looking at the prayer of Jesus, what he meant when he said, your kingdom come, and, uh, and also making reference to Mark Patrick Hederman, who is the abbot of Glenstall Abbey. I want to thank Janet for sending me a link to this man, never heard of him, and then watch something. And I'm going to start off perhaps with what, what he said and what struck me. Because you said, Janet, I think this will resonate with you. And I think I know which bit you were talking about. So he begins in this interview. I will try and link it so you can watch the whole video yourself if I can. It's not a YouTube video, so I don't know if YouTube will like it. You know, it might not like you referring people away from YouTube, but we'll try. I'll try to put it in the description. But he says that as a child, he would stop on, he remembers stopping on the avenue on the way home. And he just had this sense of suddenly feeling that I was in connection with God. And uh, as a young person, he knew that he had to either make a decision, that either he was God or there was something else that was God out there or wherever. And if so, I want to make sure that I'm in contact with whatever is running this universe. That was his words, whatever is running this universe. In other words, the highest information it was never a voice that he heard, it was just a presence. It was sensing a connection rather than directly speaking to someone. And it ma he made it the main goal of his life then, to be in constant connection with God. Now he's a Catholic, so he's using the word God. Okay, so a non-dualist might not use the word God, although increasingly some are starting to use the word God. It's just easier as a generic term. And he said it wasn't without selfish motivation. I wanted to be as close to where the action is, as close to what uh, to whatever was guiding us in whatever direction it was going or it was meant to go. So these big questions of life, what is the meaning of the purpose of life? I wanted to be as near to that cockpit as possible. And I love the fact, way that he used the word cockpit, this idea of something guiding and there being this sort of management and how we can be in connection and communication with that. We can receive the information that's higher. And this brings me to this quote then about what does it actually mean? It's easier for a a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Well, you know, you mentioned the obvious uh, explanation, which is, of course, to do with greed, to do with wanting money. And, you know, it's this it's the Charles Dickens story, isn't it, of the Christmas Carol with Scrooge, just saving and hoarding and being greedy, usually by fear or some sort of protectionism and 
missing out on what's really valuable. And in that story, he gets the chance, doesn't he? To it's almost like, it's almost like a, the um, near death experience in that story. The way that he has the dreams, or in the middle of the night, he's visited by the the angel. Is it of the ghost, rather, of uh, Christmas past, present, future? And he just sees the way other people are seeing him. He gets a chance to have like a life review, but also a prophecy. Of, is this going to be how it works out? And he decides to change and to invest in a different way to invest in people, in community, in family, in, in relationships, rather than in money. So that's the obvious way. But there are other ways of investing, not just the material. So let's think about the different ways of being. There's the material, obviously, which is the physical body, and we tend to think of money and uh, to, in relation to the physical and that's really what Jesus was saying when it, we think of that he meant when he talked about rich and treasures, because he also said somewhere else, don't, don't uh, build up your treasure on earth where uh, moth and can corrupt or decay or where thieves can break in and steal, doesn't he? So he's talking about physical 3D reality. But, but make your treasure, build your treasure in heaven where nobody can break in and steal it. It's talking about vibration, vibrational levels that determine location. And the kingdom, if you think about it, is actually a spatial concept. It's a feudal term, but it's about territory and inhabitants. So there is a community in that idea of kingdom. And so how do you enter that kingdom? It's vibrationally by which you enter the kingdom. Where are you invested? If you're invested heavily in earth in the 3D, you're not going to be vibrationally at the kingdom. So you kind of don't get access, not because someone's, some Peter's on the gate saying you've been a bad person and you can't get in. And it's certainly not something that's at some future time projected in the way that we're used to thinking, like after you die, whether you'll be allowed in or not. It's to do with reality, levels of experiencing reality, ways of experiencing reality. And so you're not going to be in there if you're heavily invested in the physical. But there isn't only the physical. If we take this Hindu kosher me uh, uh, model, they have this idea of the bodies. I think there are five of them or seven of them. I'm not sure because it's not my background. I'm you know, not from the Hindu or Buddhist background, but I do know they talk about these, the bodies and they have the physical body, which is dense and heavy. So if we're speaking vibrationally, that would be a really slow vibration that gives that materiality and density. Uh, airplane passing and then if we have the next body up that would be like astral body which is a, the subtle body it's sometimes called and that's where you are what you're activating when you dream but it's still part of a dualistic way of experiencing so in your dreams there are stories aren't there there are people avatars people that you're actually engaging with some people say that you're all the characters in your dream but in imagery in thought it's interaction it's places people things happening you know little dramas unfolding there's a timeline this happens first then this then this sequential so uh, it's still dualistic and that's also the um the subtle body the uh, um Emotional, mental and emotional. I think the mental realm is actually the next one up, but let's just let's just sort of group them together really, because it's all in varying gradients, if you like, from, from darkness or heaviness to lightness. So you have the mental and emotional body. And the mental and emotional body are still part of the dualistic realm. So where are you building your treasure, Jesus is asking, in heaven or on earth? So if it's on earth, the dualistic realm, it can be not just in, oh, I'm, I, I want to really have lots of material wealth. It can be that you're heavily invested in the mental and emotional aspects of life in this world, this earth, this 3D experience. 
in all that's going on, in all that's happening here, in the drama of this life. Heavily invested in it. Heavily invested in the different stories about what, what is important and what is really happening. And you put all your trust and, and um, energy into that. You're building up treasure. You're, you're investing on earth. Where moth can decay and thieves can break in and steal. What's that all about? Well, that's because things and events that seem out of your control can so easily switch and change. And then one minute you're high and one minute you're a roller coaster of emotion if you're allowing your investment in the emotional body and the mental, the same, knowledge, information. <laughs> People trade in information. It's the way in which they, uh, that's an, they, they lure you into an investment. It's not just about we give me your money because I want to put it in this, you know, whatever, Bitcoin or whatever. Um, but it's it's actually, will you give me your will? Will you give me your mind and your will? And then you get on board with this idea and run with it and become part of this tribe because it'll grow. And then you end up recruiting other people to an idea or a philosophy or an ideology or a theory about life and what's happening. So everybody's wanting a little bit of you, a little bit of your will. If you were using myth uh, mythological language there, you'd say... This is how we're played by the rulers of this dark age, the uh, archons or the demigurges. You know, they, they, they exist through the energy that you give them by your will and by your mind and your emotion. Do you find that after you've been scrolling a lot, I don't know why I keep pinging, somebody's trying to get in touch anyway, see you later. Or it might just be people sending me nice comments on videos or something. That would be nice to think. <laughs> But you find if you're scrolling and you get uh, drawn in by the algorithm and then you end up watching lots and lots of different things. Have you made that mistake? I sometimes watch things that I don't particularly like just so that I'm informed of what's happening all over, you know, all over the place in terms of ideas and thoughts. And then because I've watched one, because I'm curious and I want to know, the algorithm thinks, oh, she likes this. And then they keep sending me loads of that stuff and I get just, it's like being spammed. Uh, so this is the thing, you can end up going into this rabbit hole and spending hours. And when you've finished, you've not even moved from one seat, but you feel drained, you feel exhausted. Why? Because you're giving your energy to it. You're giving your thoughts to it. Emotionally, you're invested because it works on emotions, either pressing your buttons to get you annoyed or giving you more of what you really want. You know, it's like a kind of porn, you know, it just keeps feeding you because you're feeding your desires for this particular outcome or whatever that you think is good. But that can so easily switch and you, um, you're kind of addicted, you become an addict to it. So that's another way in which you can be building up your treasure. But Jesus is saying again in that, in that phrase, I read it this morning, the, I can't remember where it is, but it's, um, I think it's in Matthew somewhere, but it says, again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than a rich man into the kingdom of God. In other words, that word again, when I was looking at it, I, was, I knew I might be making a video and I'm saying, give me something fresh on this. I've heard it so many times. Give me a fresh word and an understanding and an insight to share. And the word was the first one that you often miss, or the bit that says again, I tell you. In other words, he must have kept banging on about this. I keep trying to get you to understand this. Again, I tell you it. And we all think it's about not uh, not being greedy, you know, like you're not meant to want nice things. And we're missing the point because it's about so much more. What he's trying to say is the second part of it. We emphasize the first part of it. Don't do that. Don't be greedy. Make do with what you have and just enjoy spiritual things. What he's really saying is build up treasure in heaven. This is far more important 
This is really being in the cockpit and you're missing out on it. So what is this in heaven? Well, in the Hindu model, they have this uh, other body which is beyond form. It's the into the causal, the causal realm or the causal body or the causal kosher. And that's the body of bliss, sometimes called the body of bliss. Why is it the causal place? Because you let go of attachments to the outcome. Attachments to the needs of the body and the needs of the mind and the emotions. That, that are really running the show. And, you, you know, you, you're not really free. You're just at the whim of emotions and mind and thoughts. Thoughts keep giving you invitations. Emotions will keep drawing you into responding to things so that you're anxious one minute, maybe excited the next, but you're, you've not got that peace that you long for. So the causal or the bliss is the effortless state where you've just let go of all the expectations. But that's where um, you're hearing the uh, the voice of, uh, what was it, was it Mark Hedison said, you know, you're getting the, uh, you, you're in contact with whoever is running the show, running the universe. Because your mind is cleared from all the ego stuff. The, the attachments of the small self. And that's when you're able to just re rest in being or the big self, which is the bigger picture, the big plan. That's the kingdom. And the kingdom is not an empty emptiness. It's a community. It's a communion of angels and guides and Swedenborg, as I meant to say about Swedenborg at the beginning, I am going to talk about Swedenborg. He had these visions of angels a lot and he talked about this temple of wisdom. And in this temple of wisdom, you have the angel of truth, if I remember rightly, truth and love coexisting together. And the idea is that where truth is, Love is also. So anything truthful will always feel loving. The only way you can really know that you're in touch with truth is when you know that you're not invested in it. So you're not, you're not wanting this or that to be true or, or real. If you're wanting something to be true or real, then you're going to be able to um, you're going to be able to justify any inconsistency to get you back to what you want the outcome to be. And this is how you know you see this happening all the time when something doesn't work out the way somebody gives a prophecy it doesn't work out that way so then they they sort of change the story to say oh well that's because of this and like jesus said you hypocrites you can justify your every inconsistency because you're attached you're building up your treasure on earth be that physical or mental emotional but if you just let go of it all, step out of the story, surrender to the higher truth. And there aren't lots of different truths. There is only truth. There's only one truth with a capital T. And that doesn't need defending. Oh, it makes you want to laugh. It's so liberating because you get a lot of people running around like, like headless chickens, feeling that they've got to defend the truth. If only you know what was really happening. But one day it's all going to be disclosed. There'll be disclosure. And it's like the more they have to re 
tell the story and retell the story and recruit people to the story, then it's going to somehow make truth happen. No, truth doesn't need your efforts. Truth doesn't need defending. It doesn't need saving or rescuing. It, it just is. Without any effort on your part at all. In fact, the only way you're going to get there is instead of clinging to your own ideas that have become very precious to you, you're just willing to let them all go. Because if it's not true, if it's not still, well, let me think of how to say this, if it's not still there when you've let all your ideas and attachments go, then it's not real truth anyway, is it? And if it's not real truth, do you want it? If you can say yes, you still want it, then you're admitting that you're, atta you're, you're clinging to a lie, to a deception. I'm being a little bit obtuse and abstract in what I'm saying, but I hope this is speaking to someone watching this. So in Swedenberg's vision, you have whatever is true will always feel loving because the angel of truth and the angel of love stand together in the temple of wisdom. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Poor in spirit, what does that mean? Humble, it just means letting go. Not feeling that you're rich in the sense of having the knowledge, letting go, saying, I know nothing. This is what Swedenberg also used to say a lot. Those, in terms of wisdom, the, the, the ones who think they're wise, the things think they have the knowledge, are the ones that don't make it into the, this this uh, temple of wisdom or the kingdom, one might say. The angels who are already there will tell you, we know nothing. We know nothing. Because it's always just surrender, submission to the higher. We're just serving. We're just messengers. We know nothing of ourselves. That's what an angel is, a messenger. But Mark knew Abbot Mark Hederman knew that there is this way of being in constant connection to God, to higher truth and wisdom, which is just a silence, a letting go, waiting on and listening, not, not even to a voice, but to a presence. And that presence always feels loving. And to come back to the Hindu idea of the causal, the word causal meaning like creative, what causes things to become manifest. This isn't about calling on angels or gods to do your bidding, because if you're thinking that way, you're still invested in your will and your mind and you're still in the dualistic realm and you're kind of playing with... You're playing with fire because you're actually getting the archons who rule that realm to be helping you, but they don't do it for free. There'll be a payment and that payment will be your soul. You pay with your soul because they'll want something back in return and you won't really be free. The only way to freedom is letting go completely and when you let go completely you rise above duality vibrationally you're in a different place a place that feels lighter i think this is what the non-dualist you remember i made the video a few videos back about the the radical non-dualist saying there's nothing there's nothing nothing matters oh here we're at bohemian rhapsody this time for those of you who like the musical allusions nothing really matters and there's something quite liberating about that. It's a surrendering and a letting go to the absolute. If it's not absolute truth, I don't want it. I don't want a, a manufactured truth. 
I don't want a coercive fantasy as someone's agenda. You know, feeding someone's agenda. Just don't want to be a pawn in a game. That's not true freedom. So I'm willing to let go of all of it. Only then are you vibrationally aligned with heaven and the community of heaven. And when you can do that, heaven will speak to you. In your heart, heaven will speak to you. And this brings me to Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And to this other, let me just go to it. Where, where was it now? Someone else. Um, let me see. Psalm, this is, I don't know your name, but your username is the silence within and you've you've changed the 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 e's to threes so we've got three 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 which is lovely i love that username good morning from the us jill i hope all is well with you can you give me a, a positive reflection i think uh, you're saying on this psalm and it's psalm 51 10 to 12 verses 10 to 12 and you say creating me a clean heart O god and renew a steadfast spirit within me do not cast away, do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me to the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Yes, Create, create in me a clean, pure heart. We're back to Ho'oponopono. And the cleaning of the memories, the cleaning of the information or the data that tells the story of who you are, what life is about, what is happening in the world, all the stories, all the data, all the information, information overload. Confusion, conflicting information, clear it all, create in me, create in me. We're at that place of causality, in the non-dual, above and beyond the dual and the warring stories and chaos of this life, this 3D experience of life. creating me a pure, clean heart. And do not cast me away from your presence. Your presence is peace. Your presence is love. Truth feels loving. You're in the presence of truth. You're in the presence of love. And you'll feel it that way. If you're feeling any fear from what someone is telling you is true, what story they're giving you, if fear is there, then it's not truth because perfect love casts out all fear. Truth is always loving. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. The Holy Spirit, not lower spirits, the Holy Spirit. Restore me to the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Build your treasure in heaven where no one can rob you of it, of that peace. Thieves can't break in and steal. Moth won't corrupt. I hope this speaks to somebody today. Thank you for your questions. Keep them coming. And uh, yeah, do, do, do comment. I'd like to hear what you have to say. And 
I just like to get to know you anyway. It's just really nice building a little community of people who think in a similar way. So the words flowed. I don't know if it made sense. But thank you, spirit. See you next time.